Well, praise Almighty God. Come on, give God praise in this place. Just, just love on him for a moment. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. If you agree with that, come on, give him praise. He's a mighty God. He's a wonderful God. He's a God that never lets us down. He's a God that's always there. He's a God that's done some things for you that you've never told anybody else. He's a God that's kept some secrets you still don't want anybody to know. So right now, just give him praise in your own place. Forget about what anybody else is doing. If you love him, if you love him, if you love him, if you love him, if you care, come on, give him praise right now. Give him praise right now. Come on, come on, come on. That's, come on, you're just about there. Come on, praise him, praise him, praise him, praise him. Praise him. No one in the sanctuary should, should be without giving God praise right now. Come on, come on, come on. Raise it up, 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 raise it up. There should be a sound of praise in here. Raise it up, raise it up, raise it up. He's been too good. Come on, he's been too good. He's been too merciful. He's been too kind. He's given too much grace. So right now, right now, with one voice, we praise you, Lord. We thank you. We love on you. You're our God. You're our Savior. You have done everything for us. We've done nothing for ourselves. You've kept us in our right mind. You've given us health and strength. You've saved us from things that could have taken us out. So right now, we give you praise. We give you praise. We exalt you. We magnify you. We just love on you. We don't know anything else to say, but thank you. We want to say something else, but our vocabulary is not consistent with what you have done for us. We just say thank you. Hallelujah. 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 Praise almighty God. I don't know about you, but I love him. I love him. I love him. And he loves me in spite of me. And he loves you in spite of you. And we praise him. We praise him. We thank him. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. We're certainly thankful to God to be here. Thankful for the invitation. I thank God for uh, your pastor, my nephew. Help us. Come on, just praise God for Pastor Devereaux Hubbard. What a blessing. What a blessing. What a blessing. Hallelujah. Come on, come on now. I, I, some of y'all don't see you doing nothing. I'm watching. I'm watching you. you yeah, that's, that's right. Thank God for him. Thank God for him. What a wonderful gift God has given to St. Paul. What a wonderful gift God has given to St. Paul. And we cannot honor him. You know what's coming right now. We cannot honor him without honoring the woman who stands by his side. Come on, we thank God for Lady Christy Hubbard. What a blessing she is. I'm telling you, that's my niece. What a blessing she is. She did something else. And I thank God for her and certainly all of the officers here, all of you that share. We praise God for you. And before I get into trouble, I got to just thank God for the woman who stands by my side and has been doing that now for this almost 42 years. We dated five. I want all, you know, it's almost 47 years, so I want all of it. I want all my time. Amen. Thank God for Lady Helen Triplett. Praise God. That's her right there. Stand up, baby. Stand up. You sit down. Stand up. Now, that's her right there. Amen. Amen. For the last two or three weeks, she's been celebrating her 75th birthday. Amen. Her 75th birthday. It was on December 4th, but she was celebrating before then because all the kids came in and celebrated because they wanted to be with her. And then, then on the 4th, we, we, we tried to celebrate her again. And she's still celebrating. There's still balloons hanging in my house and all kind of happy birthday stuff. I said, when is this stuff coming down? And she said, when I get ready. So I left that alone. I left that alone. But she's a fox at 75. Amen. Amen. She's a fox at 75. Amen. I praise God for her. And we certainly, I thank God for these two individuals here. And then I'm going to get into the word of God. I thank God for them. They have been a blessing to us since we moved to Chicago. We've been in Chicago a year now. Uh, we were almost 24 years in New Orleans. And most of that time, we were away from family to get to Chicago. And I didn't understand when God told me I was at home. Three years ago, he told me, you're home. I didn't even know what that meant. But I was in Chicago, and he said, you're home. 
and I schedule myself, you know, my schedule uh, don't mean nothing to God, you know, my schedule. And my schedule was to retire this year uh, in the month of October. And God said, no, you need to retire now. And that was last year in the month of October. And God just put certain things in my place. I, I told the Lord that when I, when I retired, I wanted to be a place where I could be with a young pastor and, and serve there because I, while I retired from pastoral ministry, I didn't want to retire from ministry. And God is a God of timing. If I hadn't retired when I did, uh, I'd have missed what God had for me in Chicago. Also, I'd have missed who God had for our church uh, when I left because that's very, very important to me. The United Fellowship would be in good hands. The United Fellowship is in good hands. And I praise God for that. When we got to Chicago, God placed two people in our lives. And I'm so grateful for them. Uh, the Stapletons are here. They, uh, I'm saying Demon drove me here. Tish is with y'all. Y'all just stand up. I want you to see two people. We've adopted them as our children. We've adopted them as our children. And on the spur of the moment, at the last minute, they drove for us here because my son and, and my daughter, we don't use the in-law thing, but my son and daughter were coming with us. We had death in the family, and they had to remain. We got here late and made sure that we wanted to get here. But I thank God for people. God will place people in your lives the right people in your lives. God will place the right people in our lives. As we look at this word today, I praise and thank God for God. I, I know God keeps changing what I want to do. And I thank him. I thank him for that. There's a verse in John chapter 17. John chapter 17 is a passage, a chapter in scripture that I hold dear uh, to my heart. And there's one verse there. And before I read it, I, I, I want to say this. I, I need to say this to kind of um, let you know where I'm going and, and what's in my heart. I, I am concerned about the body of Christ. No particular, no particular congregation. It's the body of Christ worldwide body of Christ. We're living in a day and time now where stuff is messed up. It, it's just messed up. We may as well, it's messed up. And in the United States, um, it's, 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 it's messed up like I've never seen it before. Uh, more people are being murdered than I've ever seen in my life. Uh, sin is at a high. I know we don't, we, don't, we don't use that word in a lot of places in the body of Christ now. Uh, we, we, don't, we don't say sin anymore. We say people got issues. Uh, people got issues. Well, the Lord called it sin. And there's sin in the world. Babies are being killed. It's not safe anywhere. I don't care where you live, how many gates you are behind. It's not safe anywhere. And that's one of the reasons we have to give God praise for protecting us because it's not where we live that's protecting us. It's not the area of town that you're in because it's everywhere. And what bothers me, what bothers me, and when I grew up as a child in East St. Louis, Illinois, uh, I grew up a child right there. Yeah, East St. Louis. Amen. Shout out for East St. Louis. I, I grew up right in East St. Louis, Illinois, and I remember people. I was on Market Avenue, and I could see the John the Shields from where I was. And you could go down Bond Avenue and the John the Shields, and you would see people asleep in their yards. Uh, because they didn't have air conditioning. And they would actually have TV sets on, sleep in their yards down Bond Avenue. Their doors were unlocked and nobody bothered them. No one bothered them. Nobody touched them. They, they were not afraid to do that. That's something you, now you'd be almost out of your mind to do that today. But then it was. And, and I remember, I, I remember, I remember, nephew, I remember pastors that, that, that poured into me pastors that preached the gospel and pastors that took the gospel that they preach out into the community. Uh, my pastor and his grandfather was one of those. And Dr. Garfield Hubbard Sr. Uh, had no problem speaking to, for God in political arenas, in the streets, wherever, no problem doing that. And I remember in the city that I grew up, and some many of these pastors were not, not 
seminarians. Many had not gone, but they knew the Lord. They knew the Lord, and they preached the gospel. And I remember, I remember growing up there in, in, in East St. Louis, Illinois, that there were very few reports of people getting killed, very few reports of a lot of the things that's going on right now in small churches, small churches, and people that were not that educated. But what happened inside of the building somehow made an impact outside of the building to the point that even drug addicts and, and alcoholics, when they would walk past the church, they would do their best to try to straighten up. Because while they may not have been believers, they had a respect for God and his building and his church. And now they'll sit on the church steps and smoke whatever they're smoking and, 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 and drink whatever they're drinking and use vulgar language. On the church steps, it's a different day. And that troubles me. What is going on in the body of Christ when we have more people more resources, more education, more prepared pastors than we've ever had in the history of the black church in particular. But yet all of this sin, all of this murder, all of this drug addiction, all of this robbery, people running into stores and snatching things out of stores and running out, all of this is happening in the shadow of the church. And the question has to be asked and answered, what has happened? What has happened? In John chapter 17, Jesus prays. Jesus prays. And verse 3 is the verse that, that grabbed me, that God brought me back to and it grabbed me. Verse 3 says this, and I'm reading from the NIV. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God. And Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Now, this is eternal life, that they know you, not that they go to church, but that they know you, not, not that they hold offices, not that they, because of the fact that they hold titles, but that they know you. Not that they're consistent in giving their tithes and their offerings, but he says, this is eternal life, that they know you, that they know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I don't want to tag this text this way with just those two words, knowing God. Knowing God. You've got to know God. You've got to know God. I don't know if y'all talk to one another or not, and I won't have you doing it that much, but I need you to say somebody to, right now to your right or your left, just say to them, you got to know him. You, you got to know him. I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad you're at church, but you got to know him. 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 This comes back to my mind, and it comes back to my mind for a reason, and I've heard it over and over again when people, especially in politics, are retiring. On Wednesday, April 11, 2018, the Speaker of the United States House of Representatives, Paul Ryan, resigned as Speaker, and this is what he said. He did not want to be known by his kids as a weekend dad. Now, now, I don't believe that's the only reason that he retired because a whole lot of stuff, if you remember, was going on. But he said that he did not want to be known as a weekend dad. Only seeing his kids and they seeing him on the weekend created a major gulf between father and children that severely hampered their ability to truly know one another. Weekend father, only seeing his children on the weekend. Children that needed the love and covering of their father, only seeing him on the weekend. And that had something to do with them, their ability, listen, their ability to really know one another. The weekend relationship with his children, if continued, could cause serious problems in the future when they needed each other the most. Watch this. Such is the challenge that unfortunately we face in the body of Christ. 
Too many people don't know God. And too many people only have a weekend relationship with God. It's Sunday. It's Sunday. I find him on Sunday. I leave him where I found him. I go do my thing all week long, and then I come back for that Sunday feel good. But I want to suggest, no, it's not suggest. I want to state that it's impossible to really know God when all you have is a weekend relationship. God is too big. There's too much of God for us to have just a weekend relationship and truly know him. Too many people have a weekend relationship. And, and a text comes back to me. Jesus, Jesus is saying, he says, in, in that day, there will be a day when many people will be crying out, Lord, Lord. And I will say to them, depart from me, for I never knew you. Listen, you were not around me enough for me to know you. You left me where you found me. You did not say anything to me. You did not represent or represent me after Sunday. It's not just about representing God, but it's about representing God because the task for us is that people see less of us and more of him. God is more for them, for them, God is more of a superficial acquaintance than a supernatural, knowledgeably ingrained and trusted reality. I remember we used to have testimony service at the morning store, Missionary Baptist Church where I grew up. We used to have testimony service. And one of the testimonies, you could always count on someone getting up and saying that I got acquainted with him a long time ago. I got acquainted with him. Well, it's not enough just to be acquainted with God because being acquainted with a person is simply saying that I don't know them very well. An acquaintance with God is not knowing God because let me see if I can place it this way. When people in your life are only acquaintances, you will not trust someone you're just in, tra in, 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 in this, this really superficial relationship you will not trust someone you're just acquainted with with the most important things in your life. You're not going to give that person your credit card. You're not going to give them a key to your house. You're not going to give them the code to your alarm system. You're not going to entrust them with your children. And the reason you won't do it is because you don't know them well enough to entrust the most major things in your life to him. And that's why so many of us don't give the important things to God. We don't know God. Oh, Lord, I wish y'all just stay with me. We don't know him well enough to trust him with our health, to trust him with our finances, to trust him with those things that's most important because we don't know him. I'm speaking of the body of Christ that churches are being filled all over the country with people that do not have a real relationship with God. They have religion. And there's a difference in religion and relationship. And when you only have religion, you don't do the things that God has called us to do as his children. We have a one-way relationship with God. We're concerned with what God is going to give us but we're not concerned with what we need to give God. God has some requirements of his children. Can I, can I go here? Can I go here for a moment? He says, listen, if anyone's going to follow me, you got to first of all deny yourself. Take up the cross and follow me daily. Now, that's an interesting and a powerful verse because here's what he says. If anybody is going to follow me, the first thing you've got to do is deny yourself. You no longer are the most important one. You are not the one that you have to think about first before you act. You have to have self-denial. And one of the most difficult things for a human being to do 
that's not filled with this Holy Spirit, that's not close to God, that's not walking with God, that that's, does not know God, is to deny yourself. Then watch what he says. And take up the cross. Take up the cross, take up the cross, take up the cross. Take up the cross, that li literally means to embrace the cross. It means to embrace it. And the cross stands for nothing but suffering and pain. It is suffering and pain. I need to help somebody here right now. I can't really see, but I know somebody got one. Cross-wearing is not cross-bearing. That little cute thing we wear around our neck is not what he meant. Cross-wearing is not cross-bearing. To embrace the cross means to embrace all of the suffering that I may have to go through. To embrace all the pain that I may have to go through. And do it without worrying about what other people think of me because my focus is in my purpose. Here's what he says. Here's what, here's what I said. He says, listen, the body of Christ in general, in general, doesn't know Christ very well. Just don't know him very well. The reality is that we often trust people more than we trust God. And the reason we do that is because we know them better. We know people better than we know God. And I need somebody to be honest in this place. There's somebody in your life that you wish you never listened to. I, I know you, you don't, I, I know it, I, I, I know I'm not the only one here. There's somebody in your life whom you trusted that you wish you had never listened to because people that's dealing with their own problems have trouble helping you with yours. It's like single people giving you marital advice. Why are you listening to single people about marriage? It's, it's interesting, it's interesting, it's interesting, it's interesting. We know church better than we know God. Let me say that again. We, we have mastered doing church and failed in being the church. I, I'll say it again because we, we, we have mastered doing church, having church, but we fail in being the church in the body of Christ. We know what to do. We know when to stand. We know when to sit. We know how to do our thing. We know what, when our part is coming up. We know where our seats are. We know all of this stuff. We've got the art of service down pat. We can move it with precision. We know how to do church, but we fail in being the church. Being the church takes place when after the benediction. And that's the problem. That's the problem. That's the problem. In Jesus' high and holy personal prayer in John 17, it was important to Jesus that we know God, that we know him, that we know him, that we have an intimate relationship with God. Only thing that will keep you going when everything turns, is your relationship with God. Only reason I've made it through the things that I've had to go through in this life, and many of them were tests and try, and they were hard, they were difficult. But it's my knowledge of God that God never fails, that God knows what's going on in my life, that God is already prepared a way for me to get out of it, to be well. And when you know that, you can have a smile on your face while you're going through. Can I help somebody here? God does not have to take you out of your storm for you to have peace. When you know God, you can have a smile on your face. You can have peace in your heart because you know that the God that you love is there watching and has a time. If there's a prayer that can be attributed as the Lord's Prayer, and I know in Matthew chapter 6, we want to say that's the Lord's Prayer. No, that's the disciples' prayer. But if we wanted to tag some, he said, when, when you pray, this is how you pray. When you pray, when, when y'all pray, this is how you pray. But John 17, if we want to tag one, it's the Lord's Prayer, this is it. 
This prayer has three major sections. First, Jesus prays for himself, verses 1 through 5. And then Jesus prays for his disciples, verses 6 through 19. And finally, Jesus prays for all believers, which includes us. Knowing God and his son is one of the major themes of this prayer. Now, it could be argued that the most major theme in the prayer is oneness and unity. Oneness and unity, because he talks about us being one. He talks about us being unified. As he and the Father is one, we have to be one with each other and one with God. Knowing God and his son, listen here, we have to understand, knowing God and his son is important. We got to get it. We got to get it. We got to get it. It is in knowing him because if we don't know him, we'll never have the oneness. We'll never have the unity unless we know God. It is my knowledge of God and the Holy Spirit's constant reminding of me of who he is and what my responsibility is that keeps me together. Because if I'm living life in my flesh, I lust after nothing but the things of the world. But I need God in me through his Holy Spirit helping me to deal with these things of life. And not only just coming to church on Sunday, but living out my purpose in him on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. We got to know him. 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 It's interesting in the word of God. It's interesting in the word of God. I love Paul. I love Paul. You, you got to love Paul. He wrote most of the New Testament. You got to love Paul. And Paul, Paul does something here. He does something. It's interesting what Paul does in chapter 3. Paul begins to talk to the Philippian church, and he says some things to them, and he begins to give his resume. He talks about some things, and he begins to give his resume. He, he's talking about the difference in having our hope in the law, and, 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 and you know, we still had uh, old school or if you want to, Jewish people that were a part of that church. And Paul is dealing with the law and grace. And he says, listen, if anybody could really talk about being the most or the greatest in this area, it's me. And watch what he says. He says, circumcised on, in verse 5, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, the Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law of blames. And I don't know about you, let me stop right here. I'm so glad that Paul had this Damascus Road experience. And one of the things that will help you know God, everybody needs a Damascus Road experience. Everybody needs one of those that we can get closer to God, that we can trust God in ways that we've never trusted God. That does not happen until you've had a real experience with God. Let me tell you something. It's a, it, experience is important. I thank God for my education. I thank God for what he's done. I thank God for the people in my life that have covered me and taught me and the people that I've set at their feet. But it is my experiences with God that has taught me so much more. My faith has grown, not because of what I read, but because of what I've been through. I wish I had a witness in here and say, my faith is better now. I'm stronger now because of my trials and my tribulations, not just because I read something, but because I've been through something. He says, he says here, he says here, I, I love this, down in verse 8, he says, Indeed, I count everything as lost. One translation says dung, because of passing worth. Watch this, of knowing Christ Jesus. He goes on to say in verse 10, that I may know him. I've got all this resume, but all I really want to do is know God. I need to know him because the more I know about him, the more I discovered what I didn't know. Oh, I wish I had some help in here. It's our knowledge of God that gets us through this mess we're going through right now. You've got to know him. Just being in church is not enough. You've got to know God and who he is and what he's doing in our life. We've got to know him. That's important. So here's what happens. Here's what happens. There are some results of knowing God. And I'm going to give you this, and I'm just about done. Because I've gotten to a point now, I'm, I'm not, you know, not going to say old, but I'm older. 
Uh, <laughs> I'm, I am older and I'm slower. The great Dr. Cecil Clark used to say, now I'm old and I'm slow. But if you stay with me, I'll take you somewhere. And, 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 and so I'm, I'm older and I'm slower. But God still uses me and I thank God for that. There are some positive results in knowing God, in knowing God. So Psalm 9 verse 10 says this, those who know your name trust in you for you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. The knowledge of God creates trust. The more I know him, the more I trust him. And let me tell you, I know I got a couple of witnesses here. At least 10 people can tell right now and witness to the fact that it was your knowledge of God. It was your trust in God that got you through some bad situations. The only thing that kept your mind was your trust in God. You were going through hell right here on earth, but because you trusted God, you were able to get through. People were watching you, waiting on you to lose your mind and fall out, but your trust in God paid off. It, it, it helps us. He helps us. Watch what it says in Mark 11, verses 22 and 23. Y'all don't mind if I just use the Bible a little bit. Here's what it says. So Jesus answered them and said to them, have faith in God. For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have Whatever he says. I love this. I love this. I love this. I've got to know God well enough to receive a whatever blessing. Y'all yeah. <laughs> got to think about that. I, I, I want a whatever blessing. That's the kind of blessing that I can get. When I'm, and listen, as long as I'm in God's will, his will is his word, his word is his will. And as long as I'm there, if I'm trusting God and not doubting God, I can have whatever I ask him for. Now, something wrong when we're not, that's not happening enough. That's not happening enough in the body of Christ. We talk about it, we shout on it, and we get through shouting. We're in the same place we were in, and we're in it for a long time, for some of us the rest of our life. The Bible is true. I believe the word of God. We've got to increase our knowledge of God. We've got to have faith like we've never had faith before, and we've got to believe God and trust God and praise God before we get the manifestation of what God is going to give us. I wish I had about 10 to 15 people that would just give God praise before you get it. There's some things I need, but I'm trusting God. I'm trusting God to do just what he needs to do in my life. I don't know how he's going to do it. I don't know when he's going to do it, but I know he's going to do it. I know there are at least 15 people in here that have that kind of trust and that kind of faith. Here's what it is. Faith untested really isn't faith. You don't know what you got till it's been tested. Oh, Lord, help me here. You don't know what you got until it's been tested. So here's the thing. Here's the thing you got to understand. Before it's been tested, it's theory. I hope God will do this or do that. But when you know him, that theory becomes faith. And knowledge that I know he'll do it. Faith untested can't be trusted. Yeah, Lord, I'm, 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 I'm about to get out of your hair. Faith untested cannot be trusted. So Jesus says here again in, in 17.3, now this is eternal life that they know you, the only true, the only true God. And Jesus Christ, whom you trust the only true God. There's a whole lot of fake gods out there, but he's the only true God. And can I tell you something about, uh, oh, Lord, can I say something about God's little G God, little G God? Whatever you place before God, 
becomes God. Uh, let me say, God says, thou shalt have no other God before me. So whatever you place before God becomes God. So here's what it says. Let me go. I got to get out of here. Here's what he says. The knowledge of God can phase not only greater faith, but it can phase life. Life. It conveys life. This is a point. You got to know this. It, it implies a deep level of intimacy and trust. It's something that, listen, God, I trust you. I, I know you. I'm spending time with you. I've got quality time with you, God. Quality time. Quality time. Not just this quick prayer before I go to bed at night or a few words when I wake up. But, Lord, I spend time in communion with you. i got time set aside on my schedule just for me and you. This is not husband time. It's not wife time. It's not children time. It's time for you and I, God. That's how that intimate relationship comes. And then, Lord, I stop talking so much and I begin to listen to you because God will speak to us through his holy. I wish I had a witness in here. He will speak to us through his Holy Spirit. If I spend quality time with God, the older I get, the more important it becomes that I have this time with God because too much stuff is coming at me that I don't understand. Can I talk about somebody else we don't talk about? That's the devil. We don't talk about Satan. We don't say much about the devil, but the devil is real. The devil is real. The the devil is not just a symbol of evil, but he is real. And we have spiritual warfare in our lives. And I've got to walk close enough to God and have the power of God's Holy Spirit to be able to deal with the stuff that I'm going through. Y'all don't hear me. I see empty people right now. Somebody, I bind this and I bind that. And I do. You can't bind nothing because you don't have the Holy Spirit living in your life. And you don't spend enough time with God to know him. So stop just saying church stuff. We know the language, but we're not getting the results. So here it is, here it is, here it is. It, 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 it increases, it increases, it increases those things. But then when we know God, love increases. Love increases. It's, it's, love increases. It's, 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 let me tell you something. You need God. To love everybody. I, I can't get them. <laughs> you, you cannot love everybody just on your own. You need God. Listen, and, and it ain't about color. It's not about race. It's not about gender. It's not about class. There's some people in your family. I can't get no help in here. You struggling to love. And you can't love them without God. It's easy to love people that's loving you, but it's hard to love people that's taking you through hell and doing everything. They, I, yeah, come on, all of us got some of them folk in our family and friends that's just hard to love. But knowing God gets me to a point that I can love even the unlovable. This is my prayer. Watch what he says in Philippians chapter, nine, chapter 1, verse 9. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. That, that your love may abound more in knowledge. You got to know more. You got to know God better. See, we need that kind of love that caused Jesus to go to the cross and die for a bunch of no good folk that didn't deserve it. But he had the kind of love that would cause him to die for you and I and all the filthy, dirty stuff that people do in their lives. Even the folk that were crying out, crucify him. He died for them. You have to walk with God to love people that hate you. And you've got to have more than a surface understanding of God to get deep insight into what God is doing. Because no matter what's happening in this life, I want to know what God is doing. I want to know what God is doing. And I have to walk with him. I have to have his Holy Spirit in my life. I have to do those things so that I can have 
deeper insight. The word says depth of insight. And when we got that kind of stuff, that kind of knowledge produces love. Ah, oh, Lord. And right now in the body of Christ, we're struggling. We must begin to love knowledge because knowledge under the influence of his spirit is the only way to truly know God. Can I say it again? We must begin to love knowledge because knowledge under the influence of his spirit is the only way to truly know God. We, we, got, we got to study our Bibles. Y'all didn't hear me. You got to stop just carrying it and just reading it and begin to study it. And to study it, you need some helps. We need the Holy Spirit to help us understand what God is saying and we need some other helps. You got to learn how to read some books. And you got a pastor that can tell you which ones to read and which ones to leave alone. But you need some help that you can get a deeper knowledge. You can't pass down to your children what you don't know. We must have depth of spiritual insight because when we begin to convert our opinion to truth, because a lot of truth people say and say, this is the truth, girl. It's just their opinion. And when you don't have knowledge, then your opinion ends up becoming your truth. And your truth it's not what will set you free. You shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. What's going to set you free? No. It's the truth you know. The only truth that can set you free is truth you know. And you shall know the truth. And that truth you know will set you free. That doesn't happen just by reading. John 15 says this, and I'm, I'm gonna, Lord, help me, I got to go. Jesus talks about love. He talks about the great commandments. He talks about them becoming friends. He, he, they become friends. He, come, he no longer calls them servants, but he calls them friends. And he says some stuff, no greater love that a man has than to lay down his life for a friend. Knowledge of God and love changes relationships. It changes relationships. Oh, how much better would we be if all of the body of Christ, regardless of race, regardless of denomination, regardless of all this messed up theology that a lot of people have, what if we would come together? The devil couldn't stand a chance. Everything would have to straighten up. Government would straighten up. Police departments would straighten up. Everything that we know would begin to straighten up. We would have more Christian people in offices and things like that. Only if we had the right knowledge and we're coming together as the body of Christ and stop having civil war amongst each other. Uh. It gives you strength. I don't know about you. I need it. I need it. Uh, I, the older I get, the more strength I need. I, I, it, it takes strength sometimes for me just to get out of bed I, or to go do it. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm retired from pastoral ministry, but I'm not retired from ministry. Uh, I'm an executive pastor at the Powerhouse Chicago. And Archbishop William Hudson III is the pastor that he makes sure you got something to do. You always got something to do under Bishop Hudson. You always so. Sometimes I said, Lord, I thought I was retiring. I wanted to do a little bit. God said, no, you got more than a little bit left. I'm going to use everything that you got. You gotta get, you get it. <laughs> Can I say, I just said something. Somebody should shout right there. See, you, you, you got more in you than you know. And as soon as you get that knowledge of God, God can bring some stuff out of you that you didn't even know you had. 
I, I wish somebody would say, I'm not complete yet. I'm not complete. There's still some stuff in me. God has something for me to do. But let me finish this thing. He, he, Daniel talks about knowing God giving you strength. He says with flattery, he will corrupt those who have violated covenant. But the people who know their God will firmly resist it. We're talking about the Antichrist here. He says the knowledge of God produces moral courage. The text is prophecy that reveals the work of the Antichrist. We've got to know this kind of stuff. And I know you've already been taught this. So I'm not going to stay. Here it is. Israel faced two demonic powers. Ptolemy, which were the kings of the south. Egypt and the Seleucids. In the north, that was Syria. The evil king, Antiochus, here he was. He was a type of the Antichrist. He plundered Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, pulled down the holy places, and forbade Israel from observing the law of God and their covenant. Now watch what happens. Those that did not know God well bowed down to him. But many, the Bible says, here's what it is. Many in Israel were persuaded by his promises with his flattery and worship of false God. But a small remnant remained faithful to God, refusing to engage in an abominable practices. Here's what's happening. You got to understand this. Listen, when you don't know God, you'll fall for anything. We're in trouble. That's why I tell people all the time, when you start praying, God, move my stumbling blocks, you better find out what it is first. Because you may be your own stumbling block because of your lack of knowledge of who God is. I close this out now. In Colossians 3.10, and I, I don't do no, no hollering and running and sliding and all that no more. I, I got wisdom. I used to run all out the pool pit and come down the aisles. I, and my, my eyes have got to the point now I'll make the wrong step because all this looking the same to me. So all I can do now is just preach the gospel. I just preach the gospel. I hope you can receive the gospel because... I ain't got no more of that other stuff left. So here it is. Every now and then, God let me do it. Every blue moon, he let because he know it takes me too long to recover. So here's what it is. <laughs> we have to have a God-likeness. Understand this. God-like. Colossians 3.10 and Genesis 1.26, 27. Here's Colossians 3.10. We have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. We put on the new self. It's being renewed with knowledge. The Holy Spirit is constantly giving you knowledge, giving you knowledge, giving you knowledge to live your life, to raise your children, to take care of things that are at work, to deal with people that get on your nerves. You continue to get knowledge. God is constantly speaking to you and telling us, don't worry about that. I got that. Don't worry about that. I got that. You just keep trusting me. You just keep trusting me. But then Genesis 1, 26, 27 says this. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule. Watch this. Over fish in the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock and over the wild animals and over all creatures that move along the ground. So God created man. Watch this. In his own image, mankind that is. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Now watch this. The image of God is upon us and the image of God is humanity's reflection of God it's our reflection of God this is not a human physical likeness of God because God is spirit but what we do is reflect God with our actions and what we do here's what's really happening in the world the world is seeing too much of us and not enough of God it's too much of us and not enough of God. I remember as a boy, I talk about morning star all the time, but people that knew God, you could know that, you could see that every day of their lives, and they would stop little children and say something to the children to help them become better because they knew God and the Holy Spirit gave them courage. 
Right now, the church has not much courage. Not much courage. We have to understand that God is spirited and his worshipers must worship him. Watch this. In spirit and in truth. In spirit and in truth. One, one of the things that I know about my nephew is that he's a worshiper. He, he is a worshiper. He's a worshiper. And, and I, I have to admit, in my younger days, I didn't understand worship. I, we, you know, I, I was in Morningstar from the age of about 13 years old. And we had great times at Morningstar. And the, the crew I ran with, uh, his father and, and his uncles, and uh, his one other person, Levi, I had, uh, I used to run with them all the time. And we had fun at church. We had fun at church. We loved singing. We loved doing all that kind of stuff. And then we would leave church, and we'd have our little parties and all that kind of stuff. And it, it, was, it was a situation that in my youth, I didn't really know what the knowledge of God was. I thought the church was 2908 Louisiana Boulevard. That's what we call the church. I didn't have a full understanding that the people, the body, that's the church. You, you're the church. And, and you listen, you're the church wherever you are. We have to be given a representation, Lord help me here, of Jesus Christ wherever we are because we are the church. You see, you got to stop telling people they need to go to church. And you need to start being the church. So that when you get through with that person, they come here not to find Christ, but they come here to be a part of the body of Christ because they found Christ through your testimony, through your witness. Because you realize, I'm the church at the grocery store. I'm the church at the mall. I'm the church when I go to the restaurant. And when I get one of those waiters or one of those servers that acting crazy and I'm getting ready to go off on you, I'm the church. So here's what it does. Here's what it does. You got to understand this. We have to reproduce God. And what we do, we get his qualities. We get his attributes. Uh, we get love, holiness, moral character, moral character, honesty. See, that, that, that character is interesting to me. That character is interesting to me. Here, here it is. Here it is. Here it is. That character is interesting to me because... Let me see if I can say it this way. I use fragrance. I use fragrance. I use fragrance. And many of you use fragrances. But your fragrance is simply a cover-up. Your character is how you really smell. We, we have to understand that. You have to understand that. Your character is how you really spend. I don't care what you pay for it, but your character is how you really smell. So we get moral character, honesty, courage, goodness, grace, mercy, justice, truth, forgiveness, just to name a few. So here's what we have to understand. There are a couple of things here that we, we got to do, and I take my seat. I wish uh, nobody would be gone. Okay, so here it is. Here it is. There are two things that we talk about all the time. One is holiness, and the other is godliness. I've got to know God to possess either one. But we need both in their place to be what God wants us to be. Here it is. Here it is. Holiness is positional. Godliness is practical. Get it? It's, it's, holiness is, I, I, I stand in holiness. This is my position in Christ. I'm, I'm holy. But godliness is practical. That has to do with what I do and how I live my life. I exemplify godliness with my life. Holiness is relationship. That's my relationship with God. But godliness is revelation. God is able to reveal things to me and give me illumination. Because a whole lot of people using the word revelation, that's not even revelation. Revelation, by definition, is to be uncovered. It's something that's uncovered. It's uncovered. And when it's uncovered, when it's uncovered, it's no longer revelation because somebody know it. You just don't. 
so, so here's what's going on. Here's what's going on. God gives you illumination. It's just like listening to when your pastor preaches. I know you get it. St. Paul gets illumination every Sunday, every Bible study, every conversation with him. You get illumination. See, illumination, illumination is this. If we turn off all the lights in this sanctuary, we fix it where it was just simply dark in here, and somebody walked in, all they would see was dark. They would not see any of us, though we're here. But when you turn on the light that was already there, that's illumination. And what God does is give us illumination to what was there all the time. And how many have said, as many times as I read that scripture, I never saw that. That's illumination. If we get that, we get revelation, illumination. Holiness is character. Godliness is conduct. Holiness is what I believe. Godliness is how I behave. And it's knowing God that causes us to get better with both. Holiness and our godliness. And when we change in those areas, you're going to see a change in communities a change in government, a change in police departments, when we learn how to be the church and stop just having church, that's when things are going to change. We're fussing at a lot of entities out here in the world, but they cannot do what God purposed for the church to do. There's certain things that's not going to happen until we get government officials saved. Until we get police officers saved. Until we get gangbangers saved. Nothing is going to change. And that's our responsibility as the body of Christ. And what I said, the knowledge of God gives you courage. You will say some things that you were afraid to say. You'll talk to some people you were afraid to talk to. Because here's what, here's what, and I'm done. Here's what troubled me. It's kept me. God said to the prophet, you tell these people what I say it. Tell them what I say it. But many of them are not going to receive it. But if you don't tell them, and they end up lost. Their blood is on your hands. But if you tell them and they don't listen, their blood is on their hands. You got to be careful, people of God, not to have the blood of friends and family and people that God placed in your way to witness to. And you never said a word. You never open your mouth. Their blood could be on your hands. I want to know him. I want to know him. I don't want to just go to church. I want to know God. I want to know him in a way that I've never known him before. I want to experience him in ways that enlighten me, add to my character and integrity, give me courage, cause me to be a reflection of him and to represent him. Every day of my life, not just Sunday. If I can pray right now, I... I'm so serious about this. God has started me on a series of sermons and it has to do basically with this kind of thing. And I know he has purpose for it. But I need some people here today that will say, I believe that truth. I, I, I want to know him better. I'm not satisfied with my place in God. Would you just stand where you are? Just stand where you are. I, I, I want to know him better. 
I want to know him better. I, I think I know him pretty good, but I want to know him better. I, there's no way I can know all of him. I, I want to get close. The word touches my heart. I want to know God better. Father God in heaven, how we love you and we praise you. We thank you for who you are and what you are. We thank you for this gift of life. And right now, God, we want to know you like we've never known you before. We want an intimacy with you that we've never experienced before. We want communion with you that not only you will hear what we have to say, but we can hear what you have to say. We love you enough to want to know you. We trust you enough to want to know you. And we realize that we're not where we need to be. So Father, bless. Strengthen us. That we will know you better tomorrow than we knew you today. We will know you better next week than we knew you this week. We will know you better next month and next year than we did these months and this year. So we give you praise. And we claim it for ourselves that we will know you better. We will love you more. And our relationship with you will be used to reach others as we become extensions of you in this world that seemingly has gone mad. We thank you now. In Jesus' name, amen. And praise God. Hallelujah.